roll out. I appreciate that. <laughs> Okay, we got it. We got to fix this. Let me know when. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, team. Hang with me. Way to do this. Yeah. Okay, that's good. Okay. Still not going to take down any of the tech. Yay, did it. Okay, there we go. Now we're all fine, ready, and good to go. Okay, rolling. <laughs> yes, we're rolling. <laughs> Welcome, everyone, to the 2023 2024. Um, Door County Maritime Museum Maritime Speaker Series. Really quick, thank you to our sponsors, Bridgeport Resort and Door County Medical Center. If you do unfortunately find yourself in need of medical attention, I do recommend Door County Medical. Tonight, we have my good friend, Jordan Shashelshek, coming to us all the way from Madison. Uh, Jordan is a very experienced maritime archaeologist. Jordan earned his Bachelor of Science in Archaeology from UW La Crosse. Yay, I got it right. From UW La Crosse. And he has been all over the country participating in archaeologic, archaeological projects. He is now down in Madison, where he is the founder of JC Archaeology. And Jordan is going to speak to us tonight about fringe history of the Great Lakes. Quick show of hands. How many of you have heard of like the rock? What is it? The Rock, the rock Lake Pyramids. The Rock Lake Pyramids. What about like the Lake Michigan Triangle? Apparently there's like a Bermuda Triangle in Lake Michigan. Yeah. So my mom was like, I can't believe you sailed through the Lake Michigan Triangle. I'm like, what are you on about? Um, I had no clue that this was a thing. So Jordan is going to tell us more about how these stories got started and where they, where they came from and why they still persist. So take it away, Jordan. Good evening, good evening, good evening. Uh, I want to take, thank everyone for coming out and my friends here at the Door County Maritime Museum for graciously inviting me here tonight. Uh, we're going to be exploring many strange and curious things tonight. Um, shipwrecks are inherently spooky, so I cho purposely chose a spooky topic in the spirit of the season. Um, so, fringe history of the Great Lakes. What does that mean? So definitions, because I'm philosophical and I like defining things. Fringe history or pseudo history is bad history. It is the intentional distorting of the historical record is mythologizing the past. Uh, fringe archeology span is kind of the same thing on a similar tangent or pseudo archeology span is fake archeology span is what purports to be archeological claims which are fraudulent or sensational. treat their uh, sources uncritically or they are uncritical themselves. They treat myths and legends as historical truth. They typically do not cite any sources, uh, but when they do, they cherry pick data and evidence to suit their narrative. Uh, they will cite and thank academic authors only when it agrees with the narrative that they're trying to develop, or conversely, they will also claim that there's a conspiracy to suppress their truth by authors who don't agree with them. Um, they usually put the intellectual cart ahead of the horse. And uh, what, I'm, what do I mean by that? Well, they usually come up with a conclusion first and then find evidence to back up that conclusion. Uh, generally, 
uh, science and archaeology and history do not operate that way. You find sources and you're able to develop a narrative from that. Um, they will rely on outdated or antiquated theories without res uh, examining recent scholarship. They will make and use unfalsifiable scientific claims, and they will take evidence and theories entirely out of context. So these are the characteristics that we're going to see through, we woven through everything that I'm gonna be speaking out tonight. And uh, these things uh, are going to be visible as we go on. Um, uh, so as we go on and I go through each of these stories, which there are quite a bit, uh, that uh, bear these characteristics in mind as we go through. <clears throat> so we are here. Door County Maritime Museum on Lake Michigan. And we do, we are in a strange place. Uh, there are approximately 6,000, probably a lot more, total shipwrecks in the Great Lakes. Around 700 of those are here in Wisconsin. Those are big numbers, very big numbers. And for us who live here and have been born here or have worked here, these are all numbers that we can understand. But when we get outside of this region, people coming in from all elsewhere in the United States, they don't understand uh, when they encounter it. How could this be the case? These are just lakes, right? Um, as we know, the Great Lakes are, uh, weather can be, be unpredictable or fastly changing. And um, even the most recent wreck as pictured here, the wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald, sunk in 1975, uh, you know, that was the resounding question at the time. How could something like this happen on a lake? So with these ideas in mind of how people approach the his unique history that we have here uh, on the Great Lakes, uh, keep in mind of like what an outsider's perspective might be towards this. Because it is strange uh, to when confronted with this, how much death that could there be? Uh, so, of course, in the spirit of the season, the very first shipwreck that I'm going to be talking about tonight is a ghost ship uh, known as the Flying Dutchman of the Lakes. Perhaps some of you in the crowd here have heard of it. We are talking about the SS Bannockburn. Uh, Bannockburn is an interesting ship. Uh, it was built in 1893 by Sir Relton Dixon and Company in Middle, Middlesbrough, UK. So the Montreal Transportation Company, the company who owned the Bannockburn and eventually her sisters, which I'll get to, uh, they had contracted with shipyards in Britain to build uh, steel hulled freighters. Uh, the grain trade was huge at that time. Uh, the Bannockburn and most of her sisters all participated in the Canadian grain trade at some point in their careers. Uh, they wanted to build the freighters and they wanted to build them fast, However, uh, they, they did not have the resources quite at hand. So they contracted with the UK across the ocean to build freighters that are built to a specific site, size piece so that they could fit through the Welland Canal, which was our way in, which at that time, we did not have the, uh, the St. Lawrence Seaway. Your way to bring ships from across the the ocean was to get them through Lake Ontario. And uh, even in the case of Bannockburn and her sisters, they still had to cut the hole in half and then, and and then re-put it back together so it could fit through the Great Lakes. Uh, once these ships got here, they stayed. For the most part, they stayed here. Uh, so some of her sister's ships, as we'll see later on, went to very interesting places, as I found when I was researching this talk. Uh, the dimensions, the Bannockburn, 245 feet long with a 40 foot uh, breadth and 21 feet uh, depth. Uh, and I have some, for some reason I put 40 foot again, uh, but owned, as I said, owned by the Montreal, Montreal Transportation Company and had to be cut in two at Mont Montreal to pass into the St. Lawrence. Uh, the grain trade was so huge on the Great Lakes that Bannockburn and her sisters often towed other ships uh, as consorts, and those ships were typically barges or old schooners 
and they would they too would be filled with grain. Uh, so Bannockburn and Rosemount, which was the sister ship from the contemporary from the same time, uh, usually were towing other schooners. Um, so a little bit of the overview of Bannockburn's history. Uh, in 1895, this ship broke some speed records. It arrived in Kingston, Ontario from Point Dalhousie in 16 hours, which was the fast then in 1895, the fastest time on record for a steamer making that crossing. Uh, the Bannockburn was usually the first vessel through the Welland Canal at the, opened of the opening of the season. And on 27 April 1897, it ran aground off of the Snake Island Light with $10,000 in repairs. A large hole was stove into the hull. On 15 October 1897, it struck the, a wall of the Welland Canal in Lock 11 and sank to the bottom. But fortunately, she sank in such a way that other ships could avoid it. And uh, the forefoot, which is the a metal beam at the forward part of the ship towards the bow, was knocked out of place. Um, this is going to be an important thing to keep in mind for the future. In 18, April 1898, it collided with the schooner Selkirk. Selkirk was one of its usual consorts. So what had happened is that it was towing the Selkirk and slowed down and the Selkirk hit it right in the stern. Um, in 12 November 1898, it ran aground during a gale near Kincardine, Ontario on Lake Huron. Um, on 17 May 1899, it grounded between the piers in Point Colburn, Ontario. And, in, and it, a year later, it would also ground again in Point Colburn due to low water. Uh, on, in 1901, it had collided with the steamer Kearsarge in the St. Clair River um, while they were trying to pass each other. And finally, uh, it, that September, it went aground in a storm in Harbor Beach, Michigan on Lake Huron, so opposite side of the peninsula, uh, pushed ashore. So Bannockburn went through a lot. Some would say, based on this, you could make the argument that it was an unlucky ship. But you know, when it comes to histories of Great Lakes ships, a lot of them went through a lot of stuff like this. Uh, this I mean, sure, Bannockburn, this definitely seems a lot, but more generally ships that were operating at this time had a lot of wear and tear and would occasionally bump into other things or be blown ashore. Um, possibly. Um, so the final voyage of the Bannockburn was on 21 November 1902. It was leaving Fort William, Ontario in Lake Superior, Thunder Bay and headed towards Kingston, Ontario with 85,000 bushels of grain, it's typical cargo. Um, so we can kind of track, when the ship disappeared, it's, uh, it was tracked well on its voyage across Lake Superior. Um, it, in the morning, it was sighted by fishermen near Passage Island, which is just outside of, um, uh, 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 sorry, uh, right in the middle of Lake Superior. After afternoon, it was sighted further down away from uh, Isle Royale. Passage Island is on, uh, is on the northern side of the Isle Royale uh, by the steamer Algonquin. And the thing with the steamer Algonquin, because that, that story is the one that often gets repeated throughout history, because it was one of those moments where the captain saw this Bannockburn, turned and did something else, turned back, and didn't see the Bannockburn anymore. And they always used to say that that was a reason enough that the ship disappeared into thin air. Uh, it was foggy at that point on the lake. So chances are, and I would always want to think too that this captain may have been exaggerating with whatever he got caught doing and then turning around being like the Bannockburn was instantly gone. Uh, but it made him think that a boiler explosion was a possibility. What led to its sinking? Why it would have disappeared so quickly. However, they would have heard it even at great distance. Um, and even at that point and the Great Lakes, boiler explosions were an uncommon thing. Uh, early steam had that problem quite a bit, but with steamers like the, 
like the Bannock burn here, we had kind of those kinks kind of ironed out with steam engines. Uh, so chances are it wasn't a boiler explosion. Um, the final encounter was that the, in the middle of Lake Superior, there was a passenger steamer upbound called the Huronic. And its final encounter was at 11 p.m. at night. Uh, a waiter on the Huronic who kept a journal uh, described this storm as the worst of the season. And that's where the last time anybody saw the Bannock burn. And even with the Huronic, the, the sighting was they saw the lights of the Bannock burn. Um, so chances are it was the Bannock burn that they saw. There wasn't really any other lakes, ships on the lake at that time that would have fit the description, but they just saw the lights. Um, after that storm, the, uh, there was a giant search for the Bannock burn. It was thought to be found in any number of places on Lake Superior. Michigan Cotton Island was a popular theory. Um, they sent two salvage tugs that scoured the northern half of Lake Superior, basically the entire North Shore from one side to the other, and they never found the Bannock burn. Uh, but later that week, in 29 November, the steamer Frank Rockefeller, also the meteor preserved up in Superior, Wisconsin, finds wreckage off of Standard Rock Lighthouse. Uh, Standard Rock, southern part of Lake Superior, also one of the loneliest lighthouses in the region. Uh, so they passed through a debris field, uh, thinking that maybe it would be coming from the Bannockburn, which, considering where it was in the lake at that time, is a pretty good possibility. On 15 December 1902, the Grand Mariah Life Saving Station discovered a life preserver from the Bannockburn, but they always try to say, dress this up too, saying that they found blood on the uh, life preserver when it came up. Though there was even sailors at the time that said that could have been from paint, funnily enough, but any number of possibilities. Um, so yes, the search covered all the North shore and they never found the ship. So that's a big thing. The ship disappeared with a crew of 20 people, never to be seen again. And people were grabbing at anything of where, what could have happened at the ship, much like today, much like the Edmund Fitzgerald. Uh, the Bannock burn shares a lot of parallels with the Edmund Fitzgerald in a lot of ways. Um, the British Whig, which is a Kingston newspaper, said it is generally conceded that the missing steamer is not within earthly hailing distance, that she has found an everlasting birth in the unexplored depths of Lake Superior, and the facts of her foundering will never be enough. Very prescient uh, for the time. It, but a later in that same newspaper gives us an idea of what possibly could have happened. And this uh, theory was also forwarded uh, by another Great Lakes historian, uh, Brendan Baylod. Uh, in a letter to the editor, as regards to the loss of the ill-fated SS Bannockburn, I, John Maloney, was the Montreal Transportation Company's blacksmith and braced the rudder quadrant as the hub was split. I have no doubt that it broke and the combined efforts of her crew were insufficient to handle her rudder in a storm when the quadrant gave way and the vessel being at the mercy of the sea foundered. So that's a good, gives us a good idea of what probably could have happened, right? She lost steerage in, a, in the gale in the middle of Lake Superior. Right after she lost steerage, all bets were off, filled with water and sank. Um, though there's always other possibilities being that this was a ship that was basically Yeah. It's a Canadian paper. Yep. Out of Kingston. Yeah. <laughs> well, for the other thing, for a ship that was riveted together, there was also questions like maybe it has something to do with the hull being under extreme stress, uh, which is another possibility. Um, it was full. They had, it was carrying the cargo of grain and then I had a crew of uh, 20, 20 uh, about 20 aboard. Did you say welded or riveted? Riveted. riveted. Yeah, it would have been riveted at that time. Yeah. Welded ships didn't come into vogue, uh, not until the 1910s uh, was the earliest and it became really popular in the 20s, 30s and World War II. 
Um, uh, so the Bannockburn leaves a legacy behind. Uh, every time something kind of strange happens, it's generally kind of ascribed to the Bannockburn. Uh, later on 27 March 1905, during repairs to the Welland Canal, a large piece of steel was found at the bottom of the canal. It was believed that this explained the sinking. However, this could also be a piece of metal that was left behind when she grounded the Atlock 11 uh, years earlier. And they just left it behind because this was a, this was a routine maintenance that happened years later. So there's always that chance as well. On 11 June 1905, not to be outdone, the steamer Crescent City said in the newspaper article, it says past a derelict, but they found, saw a floating part of a deck and cabin of a steamer. They believed it to be part of the Bannock Brent, though there was no real truth to it. They also said that the deck that they saw floating was painted blue and the curtains in the windows were pink, which would be uh, a very odd color choice for a great laker. Um, lastly, in 1906, a bottle was found allegedly with a message from the captain inside. They actually went as far as taking the message to the captain's family and compared it with the handwriting that he, they still had around them and it was found to be a fraud. But also this goes to show, this ship still had a lasting legacy in people's minds. You almost wanna say, make the argument that things like this are almost a trauma response um, just because of all these people disappeared and died so tragically and there was never any explanation for it, especially for the families of those who left, they left behind. And on that note, and this is, a, this is something I found, uh, this is probably gonna be the first time that this has probably been read in public in a hundred years. So <clears throat> in loving memory, memory of Joseph Dawson, who had lost, who was lost on the steamer Bannockburn, November 20th, 1902. I cannot say, and I will not say that he is dead. He is just away with a calm smile and a wave of the hand. He wandered into an unknown land and left us dreaming how very fair it needs must be since he lingers there. And you, oh you, who while this year, for old time step and glad return, think of him faring on as dear for the love of their, for the love of their as the love of here, and I think of him still as the same. I say, he is not dead, he is just away. And this was, this is Joseph Dawson in the St. Catherine Standard, 21 November, 1910. But again, this goes to show that uh, people never really forgot the Bannock Pro. Um, so another thing that led to Bannock de developing a legacy is like I said, she had a whole bunch of sister ships. And being that each of these ships were British built, they were not all built at the same shipyard. Um, these were unique when compared to other Great Lakers. They stood out uh, pretty well uh, compared to what we usually see. So whenever anybody would see one of our sister ships sailing, they would often bring the Bannockburn into mind. In fact, in some cases, I know from another uh, Great Lakes historian who had mentioned that uh, for a time on the Detroit River, one of, the, one of her sister ships would be mislabeled as Bannockburn, traversing the Detroit River, um, still long after she had sank. Um, Rose Mount in the upper left was contemporary with Bannockburn. The West Mount, which is on the uh, right here, it, that was one of the ships that had a interesting story because she ended up being being sold to Norway and used in Norway. And then when Germany invaded Nor Norway, they had taken over the, the West Mount and uh, there was being used in the, uh, the merchant navy of the Third Reich. And the West Mount ended up being sunk by a British torpedo plane off the coast of Norway. Um, and then the, on the bottom is the Fairmount, which uh, again was sold and was uh, driven ashore on, an island, on a sand shoal in the Bahamas uh, after a hurricane. Uh, after that, I wasn't able to find any further real record of it. So again, this, uh, this helped keep the Bannockburn in mind of anyone living around the lakes. 
So where does the story of the ship being a ghost ship come from? Who, where is that? Well, in 1910, there was a author, uh, some refer to him as the Faulkner of the Great Lakes. Uh, his name was James Oliver Kerwood. And he wrote this book, The Great Lakes and the Vessels That Plow Them um, in 1910. And this would be kind of like the, kind of the first kind of history of the Great Lakes in a way, not totally complete. I mean, it reads very much like a, uh, kind of like a travel book to draw people's interest to the region and, and to the history that we have here. So he was very much trying to build a bridge and get people's interest. And on that note, he writes of the romance and tragedy of the inland seas. And this is the first mention of the Bannockburn as a ghost ship. Of all lake mysteries, that of the Bannockburn is one of the freshest in memory. The ill-fated vessel left Duluth in the days of the ice devils, a big powerful crater, freighter with a crew of 22 men. What happened to her will never be known. She went out one morning, was sighted the next evening, and that was the last. Not a sign of her floated ashore. Not one of her crew was found. For, eight, for 18 months, the cold waters of Lake Superior guarded their secret. Then one day an oar was found and in the driftwood at the edge of a, the Michigan wilderness. Around the oar was wrapped a piece of tarpaulin, and when this was taken off, a number of crude letters were revealed, scraped into the wood. Letters which spelled the word B A N N O C K P U R N. The, the ore is all that remains today to tell the story of the missing freighter. And now, by certain superstitious sailors, the Bannockburn is supposed to be the flying Dutchman of the inland seas. And there are those who will tell you, in all earnestness, that on icy nights, when heaven above and the sea below were joined in one black pole, they have described, described the missing Bannockburn, a ghostly apparition of ice scudding through the gloom. And that is but one more illustration of the fact that all of the romance and the lives of men who go down to the sea in ships is not confined to the big oceans. So the guy kind of says it himself here. He was building a connection to the wider maritime history of what pe people popularly know. The Flying Dutchman, it's kind of, even at that point, we could say it was kind of a meme. It was a thing that a lot of people knew about. It was mentioned in some ways. I mean, currently in Chicago, there's a, they are doing the opera that is about it. Flying Dutchman, was, even at that time, was a popular literary figure. So in this case, um, James Oliver Kerwood, in trying to bolster and draw people in and illustrate that this history is as important as maritime history on the, um, of the ocean, this was building that bridge. So this is the first mention of the ship as the Bannock, as the ghost ship. <clears throat> Another comes from July, 1917. <clears throat> According to the queer twist, given the stories of the inland seas, the Bannockburn is supposed to be the flying Dutchman of the Great Lakes. Sometimes at night when the chill wind sweeps across the swollen bo bosom of Lake Superior and the stinging ice devils fill the air, the lookout on some lonely point calls loudly to his companion and points to where he imagines the Bannockburn, all white with ice and ghostly in the darkness, is slipping through the black mystery of the lake. And this comes from George W. Stark, who is again a very early Great Lakes historian, a century esteem on the Great Lakes. George Stark has a, also said something that is also very prescient when it comes to the Bannockburn. Almost every wreck that marks the history of the Great Lakes is the inspiration for some weird, fantastic story that, that by frequent repetition assumes the dignity of truth in a sailor's ready mind. And for that, for the Bannockburn, that is what became the truth. Because when it comes to this time, Halloween on the Great Lakes, and people are looking for spooky stories, the name Bannockburn is usually the name that's uttered. Uh, even all, all this time, I'm here talking about it now in 2023. So that in a way, it, the ship has remained remembered and its crew of 22 that have went down 2022 that went down in Lake Superior are still remembered after all this time. The ghost story has kind of kept it alive in a certain specific way, 
that um, otherwise when it comes to other Great Lakes wrecks, people usually kind of forget about it. But the thing is, is that this story is constantly regurgitated over and over again. They say it's the Flying Dutchman of the Great Lakes, but there's never an actual story, right? It just says that maybe on cold night, you will see the Bannockburn, but it is never an actual somebody has a story that said they saw it. You know what I mean? <sighs> Continuing on to more modern, on stormy nights, several sailors claim to have seen the Bannockburn buffeting her way down Lake Superior, her lamps blinking in the storm scud while the darkened pilot hot, while in the darkened pilot house, her master looked vainly for the welcoming flash of the Caribou Island light. Um, by Dwight Boyer, Ghost Ships of the Great Lakes. On, on Great Lakes, as on in Saltwater, a vanished ship has her place in the limelight, but only briefly. The march of commerce goes on relentlessly while the men who were once part of it are were gone too, too soon forgotten. They and their ship live on live again only in, a, in the occasional stories of writers who revive the mystery for other generations to ponder. So even though I said there isn't a story, we have one right here that, that I uh, talk about. <clears throat> the steamer Walter A. Hutchinson, shortly after World War II, headed to the Sioux Locks in a storm. The vessel was 11 hours from Thunder Bay. The crew knew they were close to shore, but didn't know how close they had apparently lost their electronics due to ice. The wind was blowing out of the Northwest and would, not, and would have been pushing the Walter Hutchinson closer to shore. They could steer a course more to the North, but this would put seas on the side of the ship and would cause the cargo to shift and capsize the ship. So the captain continued on course, preferring to risk running aground. They had apparently sighted the Bannockburn on a parallel course, but lost sight of her. Suddenly, a rocket exploded. The crews then saw the Bannockburn again, 100 yards off, coming straight at them. The, the captain ordered the rudder brought over hard to the north, northeast. The Walter A. Hutchinson wallowed in the high seas, trying to put distance between itself and the Bannockburn. After what seemed like an eternity, the Bannockburn passed safely astern of the Walter A. Hutchinson. The crew continued to watch the Bannockburn run aground and then rip apart at the seams. The, ban the Bannockburn then vanished. If the Hutchinson hadn't changed course, she would have been impaled on the rocks. Did the Bannockburn appear to, in order to warn the Hutchinson of the rocks ahead, forcing the captain to change course? So this comes from a fellow blogger on the internet by the name of Joe Coombs. And this is his SS Bannockburn to the Flying Dutchman of, of the Great Lake Superior. Here's the thing. Uh, after much research, the steamer Walter A. Hutchinson, completely fake. There is no steamer ever to have graced the Great Lakes with the name Walter A. Hutchinson, uh, especially post-World War II. Um, but another thing with the Bannockburn that it gives an idea of um, why hasn't it been found? Well, an example that's really modern day Comes, comes from us mere weeks ago. I'm sure maybe if some of you here have seen it on the news, the discovery of the Henry Steinbrenner up in Lake Superior, another legendary Lake Superior wreck. To get an idea of the challenges of locating Lake Superior wrecks, this is like the best example. People have been searching this for, for this for over a decade now. And with the, this recent discovery over the past two weeks uh, illustrates that. Um, the wreck of the Henry Steinbrenner sunk, sunk 11 May 1953. So there's still people around who would remember when this sank, or people who would remember their family members. This ship has been missing uh, for this long, and it only has been found in the two weeks ago now, or it made the news two weeks ago. Uh, but yeah, it's in 750 feet of water, middle of Lake Superior, which again, it's another surprising thing. The Steinbrenner is a relatively modern wreck would have been, uh, the, to my knowledge, the only wreck that was on Lake Superior prior to the Fitzgerald. Um, so again, something that's comparatively modern, they found the Fitzgerald after it sank like a day later. This one was, not, was only found here in 2023. But this illustrates the, the difficulties 
in trying to find shipwrecks on Lake Superior. I would say that it's almost tantamount of to going out to the wreck site of the Titanic at the North Atlantic, uh, because you're far away, very far away from shore. It takes a lot of fuel to get out there. And then he in the middle of Lake Superior, the weather it can be unpredictable. So it's not the most advantageous place for searching unless you have a search ship on the on par with stuff that they would send out to places like the Titanic, almost. Uh, so it's in essence, it's just challenging. So I'm going to move on to a more modern fake shipwreck here. Uh, this one has the advantage of not being real, but yet people made a large uh, commotion about it on the internet. This is the picture here, is the, the German U-boat UX-791. And this comes from an article dated 18 February, 2016, uh, from the fake news website, World Daily News Report. Uh, very popular, very uh, reason why there's so much uh, theories today uh, come from World Daily News Report basically publishing nonsense. Um, by the time I got to researching and writing it, it was shared 77.8 thousand times on Facebook. And that was as of January 2017. In the course of researching this talk, I found that the uh, World Daily News Report no longer exists. Um, and it's funny because now I'm suddenly the sole caretaker of their web, their uh, story here about the UX 791. Uh, and as of today, it remains the most viewed blog post on my blog, uh, JC Archaeology. So with the UX 791, the World Daily News Report claimed that a wreck of a German submarine was spotted for the first time in late January on, in Lake Ontario. A boat from the Great Lakes Shipwreck Historical Society was mandated, mandated by the US Coast Guard to refloat the wreck and bring it back to Niagara Falls where it would be placed on display as a museum ship. It was later identified as the submarine UX-791, a U-1200 class, which was a prototype submarine with a prototype propulsion system. Allegedly, this German U-boat damaged the very real Great Lakes aircraft carrier USS Sable and also participated in the Battle of St. Lawrence and the Battle of Niagara Falls. So with this, it drew on kind of every cliche and trope of shipwreck news reporting, but to kind of take this one apart, UX was never an experimental designation in World War by the World War II Kriegsmarine, and U-1200 was never a class. Uh, during World War II, they made it to they only made it to the Type 23s right at the end. Um, also, to go from a shipwreck discovery to a recovery uh, in two short weeks would be unprecedented in history, especially in the mid dead middle of winter on the Great Lakes. Uh, also, a wrecked submarine, especially a former Kriegsmarine U-boat, would be protected by law. Um, shipwrecks are typically left best in situ or in place. And this kind of, uh, even this fake example illustrates that. When, if it was a true U-boat uh, sunk in Lake Ontario during World War II, we have the uh, Abandoned Military Craft Act, which is an agreement that our country has with other countries. And that usually means submarines like, like this one, like a German U-boat, are typically preserved and almost made into, um, for legal purposes, they're almost their own embassy. And that's how they're kind of protected when it comes to German U-boats that are sunk off the coast of the uh, United States. Um, but it's also an agreement other nations have with our shipwrecks that are also in, located in other countries. And it's the same with the um, wrecks of the War of 1812 that are on Lake Erie. Uh, in any case, there was a real Battle of the St. Lawrence during World War II, but it only occurred in the Gulf of St. Lawrence, which is just outside. Uh, two German U-boats would later surrender there uh, at the end of World War II. 
The Battle of Niagara Falls was a real battle, but it was during uh, the Battle of the during the War of 1812. Um, also, as stated, there were aircraft carriers operating on the Great Lakes during World War II, but only on Lake Michigan. We had the USS Sable and the USS Wolverine, because we conveniently have a whole big lake that is far away from anywhere else within our borders where we can train uh, airmen on how to land and fly and take off from aircraft carriers. Uh, both of them were converted passenger ships. It's pretty, they were both also the only side wheel powered aircraft carriers ever made, which is pretty funny. Um, the St. Lawrence Seaway, which is the big way ships used to get into the Great Lakes, that did not exist in World War II. Uh, it opened in 1959. And even still in the 40s, uh, UX 791 would have had to transit several locks to get into Lake Ontario for this deadly mission. And you can't just sneak through a lock. Um, uh, additionally, so we have the picture of the submarine here, our UX 791. You can see it has a nice snowy background to indicate that it's in winter near Niagara Falls. But also, here's this picture. This is the Russian submarine K-159. We go back. So it's the same picture, just poorly photoshopped. But even still, people took it at face value. So it is a photoshopped image of the former Soviet submarine K-159. Uh, K-159 was a November class submarine, one of the earliest uh, classes of nuclear submarines operated by the Soviets during the Cold War. And it sunk on its way while being transported for nuclear decommissioning on August 30th of 2003. Um, and it sank with a crew of 12 aboard. So these, this picture showing it with the big pontoons, that's it being towed for final nuclear decommissioning. So it still had nuclear fuel inside of it and it is still currently on the bottom of the Barents Sea waiting to become a future environmental catastrophe. Um, but, and that's the, the image on the upper right there is a sonar image of the K-159 on the bottom. Uh, below, there was a historically a German U-boat, the U-791, uh, how, and it was a prototype submarine, but even still it's not UX, it's just U. And then what it was a prototype is it had a very strange engine that was experimented with towards the end of World War II by the Germans. It had a, hydrogen peroxide turbine engine. So um, they were experimenting with ways that could keep submarines underwater for longer uh, than, than what diesel and electric engines could offer throughout World War II. So in that ultimately with the type 21s that later came on, those were all electric, but the hydrogen peroxide engines were supposed to be the next greatest thing. And they were going to be the next iteration of uh, combat submarines, but they never got that far, never got past the experimental stage. Uh, they said they could get speeds up to 30 knots with this, which is also speeds for a submarine that wouldn't be seen until we got nuclear submarines later in the 50s. Um, the historical V-80 was scuttled uh, to prevent it from falling into the hands of the Allies at the end of the war. So the wreck of the, v the historical V-80 is still out there with its very unique uh, propulsion system. All this being said, the Great Lakes has its fair share of real submarines sunk in it. Um, famously, the one on the right, <clears throat> I'm sure if some people have heard of it, the UC-97, which arrived in the Great Lakes, not on some super secret spy mission, far from it. And uh, at the end of World War I, the US captured a whole bunch of German U-boats and they basically divided them up and had each of them cruise a coast of the United States. They had one for the East Coast, one for the Gulf Coast, one for California. And of course, we got one here in Lake Michigan. Uh, and we got the UC-97. And their way, <clears throat> they would basically be touring museum ships. And when you paid, they were used to uh, sell and uh, sell war bonds. That's what the, the whole drive was with these boats. So we had gotten UC-97. Apparently she had a lot of problems, uh, engine problems. They were going to do a tour of Lake Superior with it, but because of the engine problems, they canceled that. 
And the UC-97 ended up sitting at Navy Pier in Chicago for a long time. And apparently as part of the Treaty of Versailles at the end of World War I, we had to, for any German uh, craft that we had gotten a hold of, we had to scuttle it or scrap it. So UC-97 was then towed into the middle of Lake Michigan and sunk by the USS Wilmette, or formerly the Eastland. Uh, and it is still on the bottom of Lake Michigan to this day, uh, being a very, very cool wreck. Um, I would say second only to the Griffin maybe, but that's just my humble opinion. Uh, the other submarines that we see here on the bottom left, that is the George C. Baker submarine. And George C. Baker was a big, uh, he was from Iowa and he had built a wooden steam powered submarine. And that's what his, uh, the Baker submarine boat is. Uh, and uh, not really, you wouldn't think these two things would work out very well. And uh, it, it didn't. People reported that sailing inside of it when it was submerged, it was very hot. Um, George C. Baker was vying for contracts against uh, what would ultimately become our earliest submarines in, in the Navy. Um, and he lost out just because he passed away due to appendicitis. So what happened to his wooden submarine here is that uh, his wife sold the boiler and the steam engine out of it, but its wooden hull was towed out into Lake Michigan out of Chicago, which is where they had it, and sunk on purpose out in Lake Michigan. So another submarine wreck out there somewhere. And of course, the most famously, the upper left picture here, which is the Laudner Phillips Marine Cigar from 1851. And this one we know not so much about um, what records are there, basically it. I've covered them, other historians have covered them. There's not, not much to it because Laudner Phillips was very cagey about his submarine. He kept everything under wraps very well. So there's not a whole lot out there about it. Um, but what we do know is that he was testing this, this submarine uh, in 1853 in, in, on Lake Erie, trying to dive a very famous wreck called the Atlantic. Um, and essentially when he, he did his first dive, the submarine started filling with water and he was able to get back to the surface. So then they did a test dive where they lowered the submarine down with a crane and then it filled with water and sank. So somewhere in Lake Erie, we have Laudner Phillips 1851 Marine Cigar. Uh, the wreck of the Atlantic is a well-known wreck, often dove. Uh, there was a television show uh, that tried to find the Marine Cigar uh, on the wreck of the Atlantic. Uh, apparently it's not there, or maybe it's buried in the sediment around the wreck. But real history. We don't have to make up any weird, crazy World War II conspiracy stories. We have plenty of really cool real history here in the Great Lakes uh, that doesn't involve being made up. Um, on an ominous note, uh, to end the UX 791. So this comes from the author of World Daily News Report. And I think that it's pretty ominous and very, very prescient, even though this was from uh, when his website was running at full steam in 2017. The people who take it seriously are people who want to take it seri seriously. It is stupid to say, but we preach to the converts. The others share it because they want to believe it, not because they really believe it. You can inv invent everything and anything to people, and people will believe it. Honestly, it's a little disturbing when you realize that. As long as you confirm what they want to believe, they will share it. If you are against their opinion, they will immediately think it's false news. But if you go in the direction of their opinion, they will share it right away. They lost, they lost their critical spirit. Something that still uh, resonates to this day. So next is the famous Lake Michigan Stonehenge. Uh, very very quickly, uh, here on the right, we have the one an image of the sector scan, scan sonar survey of the formation. It was discovered in May 2007 during a sonar survey of the Grand Traverse Bay underwater preserve. Michigan does it a little differently than we did because they have so many 
sunken ships on their coast. Uh, in a time before the Abandoned Shipwreck Act of 1987, their way of preserving shipwrecks was to basically draw a circle around a certain area and call it a underwater preserve. And that's largely how they did it. And this was before we got the Abandoned Shipwreck Act. So thinking ahead and preserving shipwrecks. It was given the name, the title, Lake Michigan Stonehenge by Geoff Mano of the building blog in 2009. And that name has stuck ever since. It's a, it is a line of stones across the bottom of Grand Traverse Bay. Uh, the story of this and of this discovery circulates online roughly every six months since 2009. It is constantly regurgitated everywhere. Uh, it even appeared on an episode of Ancient Aliens, although they were kind of, uh, they were in agreement what they, what they said wasn't too crazy about it. They definitely, but they definitely agreed that this is something that merits further research, which is definitely true. Um, this Stonehenge is described as somehow powering the Lake Michigan Triangle in some magical way. It produces some sort of energy. And for some reason, even though, I mean, it is a vague idea, it was dated as being 9,000 years old. No real dating has really been done on these of any kind. Uh, 9,000 years old would make it, we, there's a similar site, which is what I'll get to. I'm getting ahead of myself. But here we have a picture of the actual Stonehenge underwater. And then we also have the image that is often circulated online. This one, the Lake Michigan Stonehenge. What this is, this is the stern section of a steamer called the SS Acme sunk in Lake Erie. Uh, so it's usually this picture that shows up. If you do a Google search for uh, Lake Mi the Lake Michigan Stonehenge, it's often this one because it looks like a Stonehenge, but not. But it's not. It's a it's a wooden ship. Um, it's either this picture or this one, which you get an even better, more look at the features as they're covered up by quagga mussels. Um, so a little bit on the SS Acme. It's a uh, like I said, it was a stern section. Even though that the, this looks very interesting for a wooden ship, uh, this was a very stoutly built wooden ship uh, at the time because it was the, one of the first wooden ships uh, operating that would have had a propeller, which is why the wreck is called Acme Propeller and not just the Acme because there's a dozen other shipwrecks named Acme. Uh, so it was built stoutly to deal with the having a propeller on the back. Um, it was. Built in 1856 at the yard of George Hardinson in Buffalo, New York, is 190 feet long, 33 feet in beam, and 12 foot in depth. It transported cargo between Buffalo, Milwaukee, and Chicago. Um, there's not any historical images of the Acme, unfortunately, uh, but being a 200 and almost a 200 foot long wooden ship, it had what is called a hogging truss because wooden ships, as they get bigger, they start to hog on either end which means the wood slumps. So you build this nice rigid structure that's pictured here on the left that basically holds the ship in place. So again, very stoutly built because it was a big wooden ship. Um, and it sank, its final voyage started on 29 November. It was leaving uh, Milwaukee to go to Buffalo. And um, it, uh, on 28 October, Oh, forgive me. Uh, on the 30th, or, oh, sorry, so 29 October 1867, uh, it, it would uh, be traveling to Buffalo, and it was made passage down the Detroit River on 3 November. On the next night in 4 November, the Acme was six miles off Ashtabula, Ohio, where the weather changed into a heavy gale. Uh, the heavy seas were too powerful for the ship to maneuver in, and um, all hands were meant to man the pumps and constantly pump the ship out. They tried to erect a jib sail to kind of keep the ship pointing into the wind, which also failed. And the water eventually got high enough inside. It sprung a leak. The water eventually got high enough inside where the boilers went out. Uh, then the ship continued to fill with water and all the, both crew, all the crew abandoned the ship in two separate lifeboats. And the ship, ship sunk stern first into uh, 130 feet of water in Lake Erie uh, on 5 November, 1867. 
So Lake Michigan, Stonehenge, the other title by their discoverer, uh, Dr. Mark Holly, is the Grand Traverse Bay Stones. The site was protected at the request of the Grand Traverse Bay Band of Ottawa and Chippewa tribes, uh, which are right there in Grand Traverse. And that's just a practical desire uh, that we must adhere to. Uh, often in the reporting about this discovery, this detail is always left out. There, there's like this mysterious Stonehenge that's underwater. Why hasn't anybody gone to look at it? The location is kept between uh, archaeologists and the local indigenous people. And they wish, as this being a possible site related to their ancestors, they wish for people to stay away from it. Uh, it is possible that it is similar to the caribou hunting site in Lake Huron, which was dated to the Drop 45 site, which is dated to being 9,000 years old. Uh, but there's nothing concrete. It is a similar thing. This was, in that case, it was a line of stones meant to drive caribou into hunting blinds. Um, another possibility is that these Lake Michigan Stonehenge is just an aspect of the unique geology of the Great Lakes region. Um, since this is a line of stones uh, underwater uh, in other places uh, in Michigan, uh, in the Upper Peninsula and in the Lower Peninsula, Sometimes you get a contour of stones that follow where the former Lake Nipissing used to be. So this was the glacial lake that was prior to Lake Michigan. And in other places in the UP, there, sometimes you will find boulder fields. And those boulder fields come basically are leftover glacial fe features that um, some of them are on land and some of them are submerged. Um, this is also the, the going theory for the other Lake Michigan Stonehenge, which is on Beaver Island. Uh, so there's a possibility that this is a unique geology, but again, more study is needed. Uh, this, the picture here on the right, uh, they call it the mastodon stone. It is in the middle. And they say that there is a, uh, a picture of a mastodon etched on it. So you can kind of see it in the middle there, but this is the picture undoctored. Uh, the same archaeologist who studied, uh, Dr. O'Shea, who studies the Lake Huron um, the Drop 45 site, actually got the opportunity to dive this as well. And his response, too, is he wasn't so convinced about the uh, Mastodon Stone. But the last thing with Lake Michigan Stonehenge, and this illustrates the more subtle part of a nefarious part of strange and fringe history, like I've talked about is this quote, an anomalous Caucasian people inhabited North America just when Lake Michigan's Mastodon petroglyph was being carved. This comes to us from Frank Joseph Collins, a very nefarious character. Uh, it, the article is titled Lake Michigan Mastodon and it is in Atlantis Rising Magazine number 26. So what he was trying to do here was try, to, trying to morph this line of stones at the bottom of Grand Traverse Bay into his theories about white people settling the North America in the ancient past, uh, possibly before Native Americans, which is patently racist. So <clears throat> moving on, another, another famous shipwreck that surprisingly has a Great Lakes connection, the SS Cotopaxi. As seen here, as made famous by the Steven Spielberg movie, Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Um, Cotopaxi was built here on the Great Lakes uh, in Ecorse, Michigan. It was built by Great Lakes Engineering Works, same yard that built the Edmund Fitzgerald. But uh, she looks a little different than how the movie, how Steven Spielberg depicted her. Um, these two pictures are really the only ones that exist. Um, on the left, you have a nice picture of the stern of the Cotopaxi. Um, and this was taken when it had run aground in South America. And on the left, you have a picture of it operating later in life. And on the bottom, you have the drawing of the stem winder design, which is the design that Cotopaxi was built to. So Cotopaxi was one of the series of freighters that were built very quickly to replenish ones being lost in World War I in the Great War. So uh, many Shipyards and boatyards were uh, churning out ships 
and they needed a design that was a general design that could be built quickly. And so this was the World War I version. This would be ramped up again in World War II. Uh, Cotopaxi was built uh, in this way. Uh, it was, like I said, it was the stem winder design. It was delivered the 30th November, 1918. So right after the armistice. Uh, once again, just like the Bannockburn, Cotopaxi was built so she could fit through the Welland Canal to go back out into the ocean. So it's 250 feet long by 43 feet in breadth and 25 feet of depth, 2,531 gross tons. Uh, the Cotopaxi spent time going to South America, but when it ground in South America, it stayed stuck down there for a very long time. Uh, it was sold December 1919 to Clinchfield Navigation Company. As I understand it, Clinchfield uh, owned a lot of trains operating in the south at that time, and they were big carriers of coal. So Cotopaxi was used to carry coal from South Carolina to Havana and back. Uh, that was its main course. Uh, its final voyage was on 25 November 1925, and it sunk 1st December 1925. So the Cotopaxi, one of the things that came out in the research is that these ships had wooden uh, hatch covers um, and they were easily fabricated and built. The people who owned the Cotopaxi Killingfield Navigation ha had constructed brand new wooden hatch covers for Cotopaxi but they were left on the dock before her final uh, voyage. And they were, at the time, the hatch covers were described as being in a deplorable state. So, and Cotopaxi sailed into a hurricane with 90 mile an hour winds. So it's easy to surmise what exactly happened to the Cotopaxi sailed into a hurricane with bad hatch covers. Um, how Cotopaxi relates to the Bermuda Triangle. Um, the Bermuda Triangle itself was inspired by media speculation surrounding the loss of another ship, the SS Marine Sulphur Queen, in February 1963. And it was this one wreck, it was media speculation that really tipped it off. They're like, hey, there was one wreck that was oddly lost in the Gulf just outside, because she, Marine Sulphur Queen was roughly north of uh, Cuba, between Florida and Cuba. That's where she, the wreck has never been discovered. That was the course that it was following. But at that time, any newspaper reporters were like, hey, there's all these other ships that happen to sink in this place. Uh, Sulphur Queen isn't the only one. And there's also airplanes that have gone missing here. So that eventually was picked up by a author named Vincent Gaddis. And he termed the, he coined the term Bermuda Triangle in this magazine, the Deadly Bermuda Triangle in 1964 and it is stuck with us since. Um, but here's where Cotopaxi comes up in their research. The cargo steamer Cotopaxi to Charleston, Charleston to have vanished. And this is from Vincent Gaddis and is in a seminal classic, Deadly Bermuda Triangle. And the next mention comes from the famous book, these vanishing ships, ships have included Cotopaxi, a freighter bound for Havana from Charleston in 1925. This comes from Charles Berlitz, The Bermuda Triangle, which was a best New York Times bestseller in 1974. Um, and, that's where, and that's all these guys had to say about it. And that's what's kind of stuck as this being this phantom ghost ship. However, the Cotopaxi was, was located sometime in the 1980s, named the Bear Wreck. Very little was left of the wreck. In summer 2019, it was surveyed archeologically. The size of the bear wreck roughly matched that of the Cotopaxi, and it was a, roughly in the same location, 20 miles or so away from its final transmission. The measurements of the boilers matched the plans for the Cotopaxi, and the, uh, the archaeologists found a valve with SV etched on it, found to come from the Scott Valve Company, which is located in Michigan, not far from Great Lakes Engineering Works, um, which positively identified this wreck as being that of the Cotopaxi. And this was an announced in February, 2020. What happened next? Who can tell me? <laughs> yeah, what happened in February, 2020? COVID. COVID, there we go. 
So Cotopaxi being discovered, quickly forgotten. Um, so ending up, I've already seen, realized that I'm going over time, so I apologize, everyone. Um, so how does this relate to the Great Lakes Triangle, the very infamous one? Um, so Cotopaxi kind of, uh, in, it, in it being studied archeologically kind of disputes everything it was ever said about being lost in the Bermuda Triangle, lost mysteriously. If, they, if these guys had done any sort of digging in their research, they would have found ships sailed into a hurricane with bad hatch covers. But they didn't do that. They wanted to weave it into a narrative and keep it as vague as possible. So that continued here with the Great Lakes Triangle. It was the first book about it was written in 1977. The author is kind of character. Uh, he even went as far as saying that actually there isn't really a triangle. My publisher thought that up. His idea was that uh, he was capitalizing on the success that Charles Burlitz was experiencing with his New York Times bestseller. Uh, Jay Gorley in the same interview has this to share with us. As long as you don't have to bring it into a laboratory and test it, any theory explains these things. UFO if you want, UFOs if you want. For me, it's easier to say that this is all really just really weird than to blame it all on UFOs, though I just like to write about things that interest people. Uh, more modern writings on the Great Lakes Triangle have this uh, written at the beginning of it. Uh, this, this came out about a year ago in 2022. Notice the information in this book is true and complete to the best of our knowledge. It is offered without guarantee on the part of the author or the history press. The author and the history press disclaim all liability in connection with the use of this book. We should, you know, so many other books could have that same uh, notice at the beginning, huh? Uh, for being nonfiction too. So I know I've gone way over time and I've provided a lot of provocative ideas, but I'm gonna end on this quote. At the heart of science is an essential balance between two seemingly contradictory attitudes, an openness to new ideas, no matter how bizarre or counterintuitive they may be, and the most ruthless skeptical scrutiny of all ideas, old and new. This is how deep truths are winnowed from deep nonsense. That comes from my favorite Carlson. So that ends my talk. Uh, any questions? Yeah. Um, from my friend. I would say it's mucky because you have a kind of a rainfall of sediment that falls through it. I mean, just based on the footage I've seen of deep water wrecks, because you have a constant kind of rain of sediment that goes down to the bottom. So you kind of have a haze, but by and large, it's like sphere, so it's very clear. So for the Lake Michigan Triangle, what's the general idea of the causing of wrecks in the triangle? Like, is there some kind of like, a uh, general idea or is just whatever someone thinks of at the time? Well, it's basically taking all of these disasters and putting a shape around them and being like, because all of these disasters are in a concentrated place, there must be something strange. When, when it comes to the works on the Great Lakes Triangle, they're kind of all over the map. They do set up a triangle that kind of goes kind of in the middle of Lake Michigan. But even still, they include plenty of things that would be outside of their triangle. You know what famous one the airplane is? Yeah, Flight 2501. That's uh, because that that is so uh, still unknown. That's still something that they like to grab onto. But you know, it's not like the plane completely disappeared. Uh, Valerie Van Heest uh, and the, uh, the, the her outfit on the western side of Lake Michigan have done a lot of work and trying to relocate it. And she wrote a whole book about it. Um, TV show. And a TV show. But then even in her research, that's the thing is that there was still people alive who had people who had lost people on that plane, right? So don't you think it would be, it would, how it would hurt them if somebody came up to them and said, it's like, well, your ancestor really disappeared into the astral when, they, when the plane disappeared rather than crashing to the Lake Michigan. Real people, have died. That's the, that's what this all is all about. But yes, 
Uh, many cases with when it comes to the Lake Michigan Triangle, all they have, many of the things that they've highlighted as being significant are just wrecks that they ha that haven't been found yet. And in some cases, in the most recent book that I mentioned, uh, even after a certain wreck was was found, it was still sunk under mysterious circumstances, even though the wreck is right there. So it is owned by the state. So repeat that question because that one is important to pick up for diploma. And the question was, uh, can you repeat that again? Sorry. Who owns, Who owns shipwrecks? So very important question. We there is a federal law that I've mentioned in this talk called the Abandoned Shipwreck Act, ratified in 1987. When what the Abandoned Shipwreck Act states is that wrecks that are in state bottom lands, so they have to be buried in the sediment in state bottom lands, is a property of the state whose water it belongs to. So if we were going to talk about Wisconsin, all the shipwrecks that we that are in the area around us would be owned by the state of Wisconsin. Okay, so it's like Divided in half vertically. Yes. So, so Rex on the other half would be the property. Yep. Yes. And then Rex and Canadian waters are owned by the country of Canada. And that includes uh, Edmund Fitzgerald because that's in Canadian waters. Yep. Thank you. All right. Seth, do we have any questions online? Yep. Uh, someone asked, any thoughts on the Alvin Clark? It's saying, in approximately 1869, found in 1968, covered complete off Chambers Island. Alvin Clark was a remarkably preserved wreck that um, was at that time. So when it went legally uh, at the time, Hoffman, he was a diver from Romney's parts. He owned a resort. He, his, he was one of the very kind of pioneer divers in this region at the time. And he had the foresight in looking out at shipwrecks as something that can be shared with other people or exploited, you know, uh, and draw interest in tourism. So his idea was to raise a shipwreck and make it into a museum. At that time in the 60s, 1969 was when the Elvin Clark was raised, there were already laws in place that would have pre prevented him from raising the Elvin Clark. However, they were just for there were Wisconsin law and they were just enacted basically in 1969. So there was nobody there who really knew the law yet or could enforce it. Uh, so he was able to get through that, the loophole that way with raising the Alvin Clark. It was also, again, the Abandoned Shipwreck Act was not enacted until 1987. So this was long after the Alvin Clark was raised and brought probably right before the Alvin Clark was bulldozed uh, in Menominee. I think it's 1994. 94, yep, correct. And that's a, and it's a darn shame. If the wreck was left where it was, we would still have it here today, but. All right, thank you so much, Jordan. Thank you, thank you everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Trinidad. Um, that's a big wreck that made national news coming out to talk to us about that discovery using sight sea and sonar and other equipment. And they are bringing a VR headset so you can actually like take a virtual dive on that Trinidad. So it's pretty cool.